Forced onto the streets by the economics of a global pandemic, thousands of young Kenyans face hardships. Through sports, aid groups help to keep them out of trouble. Exploring the tourism potential of Nigeria, wonderful sites across the country mean potential for more travel and tourism revenue. Hello, thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Trey Balinusawa, Channel's Television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent Makori from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks, I'm Vincent Macquarie of The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Our broadcasting looks a little different because of the global pandemic, but we truly appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Oso in Lagos brings you that story. Nigeria is a nation blessed with numerous tourism potentials scattered around the country. In this special report, Channel TV's correspondent Olu Phillips takes a look at some tourism locations in the north, south, west, and other parts of the country. As richly endowed as Nigeria may be, experts say there is need to grow the existing tourism potential such that the nation can earn more revenue from travel and tourism. Power of tourism for inclusive growth. September 27th every year is recognized and designated World Tourism Day. But what's the big deal about tourism? A quick check at tables of leading countries for tourism arrival, international tourism receipts or by international expenditures leaves Nigeria ranking low among other African countries and globally. But how have we excluded ourselves in this conversation of billions of dollars available to this sector? We took a tour of some potential sites that could promote tourism around the country and their challenges. One of the foremost sites is the Yankari Resort in Bauchi State, a state nicknamed the Pearl of Tourism, owing to the numerous tourist attractions. Aside Yankari, there are more than 10 tourist sites in the state, some of them developed, others are not. If the state is really serious about tourism development, they should put some actions on ground. The first thing is, I think they should bring out a tourism master plan. Although Bauchi State is relatively safe, but like many parts of the Northeast region, insecurity has ravaged the tourism sector. From Bauchi State, we move to the north central region of the country. Kwara this time, and what do we have? There seems to be a lot to be done by governments at all levels to ensure commercial viability of tourism centers in the state. This is the Sierra Museum in Irekwodu local government area established in 1945. Not much can be seen or said in terms of commercial viability. The Kajala waterfalls in the Felodu local government area also said to be the longest in West Africa is as deserted as it could possibly appear. But the government says it is upbeat on getting these sites to world map. Still in the north central region is Plateau State, known as the home of peace and tourism. There are numerous tourist attractions spread across the local government areas with attractive hills, mountainous areas as well as recreational centers. There is the National Museum, JOS, a tripartite tourist center. All the tourist attractions scattered across the state include its fair hills, Wasi rocks, as well as the Pandam game reserves and the Kurang volcanic mountain. Let's take you down to the south-south region of the country. Cross River State hosts an annual carnival which draws tourists and have brought in some economic fortune to the state. Some tourists who visited the Obudu Ranch Resort, another attraction to the state, call it a home. Abiyakuta in Ogun State perhaps has been made popular as a tourist site by the distribution of rocks in the Asian city and the famous Oluma Rock. Oluma Rock as a tourism site is a fusion of the old and the modern, an historic site, pride of the Agbas, 
During its downtime, it records about 1,500 visitors and doubles that at peak periods. Everywhere in Lagos appears all built up with a few historic sites that support this sector. The National Theatre is one of the historic destinations in Lagos. It is an architectural masterpiece that was built some 45 years ago, but in recent years, the edifice has become a shadow of itself. Prompting the recent intervention by the federal government and the Lagos state government, partnering with the Central Bank of Nigeria for restoration. The COVID-19 pandemic provided a reset button for the globe. The United Nations World Tourism Organization says it represents an opportunity to rethink the future of tourism sector. Will Nigeria join the League of International Destinations for Tourism? The figures will tell when computed during another celebration next year. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. Joining us now to discuss tourism is Mark Kaigua, who is the founder and CEO of Nendo, a research and marketing firm in Nairobi. Well, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. Let's start off with this. No, no doubt, I mean, COVID-19 pandemic has done a lot of damage to various sectors, including the tourism industry. Could you tell us about how governments begin to adjust to the blow dealt to them by coronavirus? Sure. Well, uh, I think that the IFC, uh, the International Finance Corporation, uh, placed it at 7% of Africa's GDP. Uh, that's the contribution from tourism. And so governments have to take notice and have to know that this is a pretty important uh, area simply because of just what it contributes. And it ranges depending on countries. You have obviously different um, types of, of offerings from different countries, from beach to bush to specialist tourist attractions all over the continent. Now, I've just returned from uh, UNWTO celebration in, uh, in Abidjan, in the Ivory Coast. And, and, and some of the, the sentiments that were shared there were focused around recovery and not just strictly what the governments can do, but tourism in particular is very private sector oriented. The recovery period now for African governments has to have them prioritize supporting the actual industry. And that can be through innovative tax, uh, incentives and certain delays to allow them to shoulder that, that challenge of lower numbers and then spurring domestic tourism. There are many tourist, tourism sites in Africa, but most of them lack proper amenities and even maintenance. In what ways can the continent improve this to boost the revenue, which will in turn benefit the economy? Yeah, so I think, I think it's, a, it's a mix because obviously to UK, the tourism sector caters to all sorts of styles of travelers. So the drying up of resources, it's the tightening of purse strings at a government level, at a private sector level, you have challenges of maintenance. Now, there are a number of solutions around this for both governments and the private sector. And this would include things such as what we might call public-private partnerships, which in very many cases already exist. Right? You have people who are flying for and stay at you know, five or seven star um, resorts or uh, lodges or all sorts of different kinds of uh, establishments. And then at the same time, go to some particular um, uh, tourist destinations that have no charges, right? Or very minimal charges and are maintained publicly. So you have that mix and that interaction. So what's, what's critical uh, going forward is just that, that conversations are had about maintaining the facilities. And that can mean, you know, installing, um, uh, you know, some certain, let's call them modest um, uh, sort of fees for entry or exit, or, uh, you know, turning it into something charitable where the local community is involved in the maintenance um, and, and just upholding the best quality for that facility that can involve training. And it certainly will involve cooperation across public and private sites. So there's many options on the table. And for me, what I've been saying about uh, the pandemic is it's a chance to actually reimagine um, how things should work. So there was a certain way they worked, and then you could never get time to maintain or to pause well because people were coming in all the time. And now, because there's fewer people coming in or certain breaks, this is the time to actually fix things from a structural perspective, a community perspective, and even a sustainability perspective. How would you suggest we approach boosting intra-African trade in the first instance? I think, well, the big news, uh, despite COVID might, you know, maybe overshadowing it a bit, has been the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. I think just what that represents in terms of the movement of 
uh, of, of goods and services across borders should be followed uh, in turn by the movement of people. Um, and if that movement of people can actually cater towards tourism, in addition to just the business aspect, that's going to be a really positive um, outcome um, that, that just you know, really augurs well for the continent over the, the coming decades. So that to me would be one of the big opportunities. I would say it's also about countries looking uh, within and just looking for how to make inclusive and sustainable experiences when it comes to tourism. All right, then, Mike Kaigua, thank you for joining us on the program today. Thank you for having me. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, Benin set up a service to allow people to register their businesses online. The e-registration system has worked so well that this West African country is now the world's fastest place to start a business. That's according to a UN agency. Moki Edwin Kinteka narrates this report by Anne Zokil in Kotonou, Benin. Sandra Edoso is the owner of a store selling art in Kotonou, Benin. She submitted a business application online and received approval and legal documents within three hours. If there is not this facility to create a business online, if one had to go stand in line, wait in line, go through the maze of administration to start a business, I wouldn't have done it. As simple as that. I would have stayed in the informal sector. To create a business, Sandra went online to monentpris.bg a platform in Benin to create and formally start a business. The site was launched in February 2020 by the country's Investment and Export Promotion Agency. It was the start of the pandemic and the agency did not want people to come into their offices. Applicants fill the required information, download the required documents and make a payment online. The documents arrive at the agency's headquarters oh, where staff yes. verify the information and mail business certificates to those who are approved. In 2019, we were at like 28,000 businesses created. And in 2020, we went over 41,000 businesses created. For us, this has been a performance. It shows us that the platform has been accepted and today we have a performance of three hours. The online service helped make Benin the fastest place in the world to start a company, according to the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Even those who live abroad can use it to start a business inside Benin. The Investment and Export Promotion Agency says it will continue to review the procedures and dialogue with the private sector to further improve the process. For Anne Zwanke in Cotonou, Benin, Moki, Edwin Kinzaka, for VOA News. One woman is challenging stereotypes and defying social norms in Rabat, Morocco, by being the only female taxi driver in the city and one of the few in the entire country. Saud Hadou finds that her driving is providing safety and comfort to other women who are her passengers. Take a look. 33-year-old Saoud Hadido started work as a truck driver after dropping out of school and worked for a fish distribution company, but switched to taxis for the better pay and greater freedom. How I chose this profession did not come by chance, because I'm the kind who likes a challenge. It started when I was with a company specializing in distributing fish in Morocco, and I was working with them distributing by truck across the country. She now earns enough to pay the mortgage on her flat near Rabat, as well as supporting a family in the countryside and has built up a solid customer base. At the wheel of her blue sedan, sparkling clean and fragrant inside, and a heart-shaped talisman with religious verses dangling from the rearview mirror, Hedido is a rare sight on Rabat's roads. For me, I rode with Suad many times and I am very comfortable while I am with her in the car. I can talk to her like a Moroccan woman 
Unlike when I ride with a man, I am silent. I cannot talk to him or even speak on the phone with comfort. But with a woman, I am comfortable as if I am with my sister or my mother. So we need more women taxi drivers. There used to be seven women licensed as taxi drivers in the capital, but they all stopped working except Hadido. Female taxi drivers sometimes face sexual harassment in form of unwanted advances. Hadido said the cost of renting the license, as well as car operating expenses, accounts for up to 70% of her monthly revenue. God willing, in the future, I hope that I will not continue to drive a taxi. My wish is to work in international transport. This has been my dream since childhood. I'm now in the process of getting different types of driving licenses and international transport. This is my life. For Hadidu, she's taken a step towards fulfilling her childhood dream. It's time now for a short break, and as we do, we remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come, improving the worth of the old banknotes of Zimbabwe. After hyperinflation devalued her country's currency, Prudence Chimtawa uses abandoned Zim dollars to create beauty from a historic a history of economic collapse. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Kenyan authorities say the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has forced thousands of youths into, onto the streets and many are turning to crime. To meet the challenge, aid groups are trying to reintegrate homeless youth through sports with the goal of keeping them out of trouble. Victoria Munga reports from Nairobi. Anthony Ndegwa recalls the day he fled his volatile Nairobi home after ongoing domestic violence over low income. His mother was stabbed by his angry aunt. I came back home from school. My mother and brother had gone to the hospital. I changed and left the house to join my friends on the streets. I was afraid my aunt would stab me too. Since then, I lived on the streets. He's among hundreds of youths now off the streets thanks to aid groups that are rehabilitating homeless youths through football. Shuba Wango says the program gives them a chance to gradually reintegrate street youth back to the society and get regular meals as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to disrupt livelihoods. Most of, these Most of them love sports, so we use that sport. We organize games so that those who want to play and are on the street are willing to leave everything else just so that they can play. And as a coach, I can't let them go back to the street after playing. Scores of the homeless have been rescued from the streets under the Kenyan government rehabilitation program since May. The program aims to rescue at least 500 youths from the street. There's someone who goes to the streets and I talk to the children. Then we have a specific day of bringing them here. And now also bringing here, which means they are basic needs that they have, they have to be given or to be provided. We have food, we have medication. The program can only make a small dent in the larger problem. Nairobi has an estimated 60,000 street families, an increase from 15,000 before the pandemic. The number is likely to remain high until the Kenyan economy rebounds from the pandemic. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. If anyone doesn't need reminding that banknotes are just worth their pieces of paper, it is in Bibrians. Over a decade ago, they watched as hyperinflation obliterated their currency and led to the printing of a hundred trillion Zimbabwean dollar note. Most bills ended up in the thrash, but Zimbabwean visual artist Prudence Chimtutawa has found value in the unloved old banknotes by using them to make art. Prudence Timuchua, an artist, wants Zimbabweans to look beyond the ugly history of the inflation considered by the International Monetary Fund as the worst of any peacetime country to see something beautiful in the bills and in the process perhaps recover from the trauma of that time. A lot of people, when they see this, uh, the old banknotes, their reaction most of the time is 
they get most people get angry <laughs> you know because a lot of people lost a lot of things and well, some other people even lost lots of money because you can just you could just wake up and boom the million dollar you had in your account is no longer functional so for me i'm trying to bring that element whereby i'm i'm like sort of celebrating for people to to see the beauty of these old banknotes so when someone looks at this artwork they go like wow and then they forget that the pain this thing has caused them her paintings capture the daily lives of women, shown dancing, cooking, or in bright and elegant dresses with the old Zim dollar notes stuck on with glue to form parts of the image. Her figures are mostly blue. I paint them blue because for me it's a resemblance of, of, of strength and uh, dominance. You know, you can't miss a blue person. You would want to, to go near and try and find out what this is all about. In one painting, a woman pours a liquid from a calabash which is made up of pieces of brown 1,500 billion Zimbabwe dollar notes. In another, a woman wears a mask and blouse made from purple 500 million Zimbabwe dollar notes. For me to kind of like bring to light what I was going through as an artist because, I mean, all, most galleries, they are closed. And it was like an opportunity for me to just get out there and have my work like out there exhibited, exhibited uh, in a physical space. The National Gallery of Zimbabwe, working with various artists, is running a month-long exhibition in Harare in a bid to raise awareness amongst the public on the issues surrounding the new normal. This exhibition has been given to the 18 to 41 year age group and the task is to depict how masks every part of life has become. The new normal, masks, vaccination, social distance, locked in scenes in a serious, realistic, comical and even spiritual perspective are all parts of the exhibition. I don't go for colors that you just... A growing number of countries are mandating COVID-19 vaccinations and imposing vaccine passports to show proof of immunization against the disease. Medical observers say preventing infection through the vaccine may help end the coronavirus pandemic, but the move is drawing strong criticism. Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu has the story. Excited fans returning to New York's Yankee Stadium earlier this month for the first time since October 2019 as the new Major League Baseball season begins. They have to prove that they are coronavirus free. Just showing the vaccination card uh, you know, after uh, 14 days is good enough. Otherwise, I know people are getting, um, are getting tested. This week, New York became the first state to offer a digital vaccine passport, a free app and website to prove COVID-free status, either through vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test. We've got to respect people's privacy. Uh, we've got to make sure that the system is accurate. There's definitely more to be worked through, but I think they'll be part of the solution. Private companies around the world already use digital vaccine certification in tourism, entertainment and other industries. Several countries, including China and Israel, have launched official nationwide systems, but don't expect the U.S. to follow. There will be no centralized universal federal vaccinations database and no federal mandate requiring everyone to obtain a single vaccination credential. Vaccine certification is controversial in the U.S. Some Republican governors have even issued executive orders banning them. Americans are often very skeptical of the idea of anything that might be centralized in the federal government, uh, and they see that kind of centralization as being an affront to either privacy or to freedom. The Biden administration is urging private entities to develop their own solutions, but will provide guidelines to meet certain standards, including accessibility and affordability. The World Health Organization is also against the idea of vaccine passports for travel between countries. We're not certain that at this stage that the vaccine prevents transmission and there are all those other questions, and apart from the question of discrimination against people who are not able to have the vaccine for one reason or another. While certification may help industries eager to jumpstart revenue, health experts say ultimately the answer is to simply vaccinate more people. The more people who are vaccinated, if we really get to over 80 percent, then we don't have to worry about those vaccine passports. 
currently, about 20% of Americans are fully inoculated. With vaccine hesitancy still a factor, challenges remain for the country to reach herd immunity. Pat Siwida Guswara, VOA News. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channel's Television has our last word from Lagos. I will look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, channelstv.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain as well. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>